are back and ready to roll. It is the postseason, postseason edition of the Shutdown Ending Podcast. This is episode number 33, and we are ready to roll. Steven Rizzotto here alongside Tyler Hall, as always. And Tyler, what's going on? It's been a little bit, but we're excited to get into some fresh baseball news. Yeah. Hey, hey, everybody. Yeah. You know, the postseason is upon us. There's been some interesting results so far, some great performances. And so obviously the, you know, the three biggest series of the year ahead of us, but some, some fun topics to discuss today. Definitely some fun topics. We are a little bit into the postseason already. Um, and we have seen some surprises. We'll kind of get into some of the, the championship league matchups in just a second. Those are already confirmed. But we do want to recap some of the uh, the other series here that happened in the postseason, starting with the wild card series. And now there were four games that were going on, kind of our four different series that were going on. Um, and just real quick, before we get into some of the matchups that happened and some of the teams that got eliminated, um, what did you think, like, what have you thought about, like, the scheduling? And I know we'll get to it in just a second, because I know that you'll touch on that in a sec. But in terms of TV and in terms of like getting to a chance to watch maybe a few games a day, how has the TV schedule worked for you? Not necessarily the the buys. We'll get into that in just a bit, but the TV schedule and like the watchability of it. Yeah. I mean, I really dug the wild card series because they have to get four games in, in one day, potentially three days in a row. Cause they need to get those over to get to the divisional series. So it was, you know, games were starting for us, what, like 11 in the morning or noon. And we had baseball to watch until bedtime pretty much. So I thought that was really cool. I think it's all kind of an awesome kickoff to the playoffs to give fans, you know, two or three days potentially of just nonstop baseball to watch. You know, once you get to the divisional series, you know, they start with, you know, uh, there's some days that have four games, but even the, you know, there's two going. So uh, on most days, so that's pretty cool. But I was digging the wild card series. How about you? Yeah, me too. And it was really cool. And I'm at school during the week, but I was still able to kind of check in on a lot of games and watch some of them live. We had some of them playing in the newsroom, but it was it, it's definitely cool when there's four games going on and they're all high profile games. Um, and it happens during the regular season, but we don't really think about it that much because they're you know they're not necessarily as significant. And the, uh, the the juices aren't as flowing when you're watching them, but um, yeah, no, there were there were some really good matchups, and I, I I think I'm starting to come around. I really liked the old format before, uh, but I'm coming around to more teams playing in this wild card series, and and I think it ended up being being some really good baseball. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I hope I'm coming around on the new format too. I hope they stick with just four from each playing in the wild card series. I don't think they need to expand the playoffs and we'll probably touch on that a little bit more, but like any more and you're getting into half or more, more than half of the teams in baseball playing. So I think it's, it's nice how it is. And it's like, like I said, a good kickoff to the postseason to give fans, you know, 10 hours a day of baseball to watch. Yeah, and I'm sure MLB maybe as a whole, the league was not thrilled with maybe some of their profitability, um, you know, from from those wild card series because they only won two games. It's a best of three series, right? And there was no game three anywhere. Um, we'll, we'll dig into some of the matchups. Uh, Texas knocked out Tampa Bay in two games. Minnesota knocked out Toronto in two games. Arizona knocked out the Brewers, the division winners over there in the NL Central. And the Phillies knocked out the Marlins. So out of all these, are there any surprises? Because, I mean, I'll start. I think the one that kind of was interesting to me was definitely Milwaukee. And they kind of took a hit with the Brandon Woodruff injury. They won the division, which kind of makes, you know, it a little different. I know they're, you know, they're not as strong as maybe L.A. or Atlanta. Um, But getting knocked out by Arizona, Arizona came to play. And we're going to talk about them in just a little bit because they're still in this thing. But uh, that to me was was a pretty interesting matchup that maybe I was not expecting. I did not have them over over the Brewers, mainly because of the pitching. Yeah, you know, I was surprised too. And one thing that was interesting was the, the Brewers jumped out to early leads in both of those games. And, you know, so I was like, okay, they, they've got it. They're in the driver's seat. And the D-backs just clawed back and, and fought back on them and, and took the series in two on the road. So that was one that definitely stuck out. And then for me also, not necessarily that the Rangers won the series, but just how the Rays just disappeared. Uh, you know, they they weren't doing anything at the plate. Uh, and, and also, you know, 
the fan, I mean, 19,000 fans for a, for a playoff series is, is really poor, but just the Rays disappearing after having such a solid regular season uh, was, was shocking to me in that series. 100%. 99 regular season wins. That's the second most in the American League for Tampa Bay. Um, and they had home field advantage. You're right. They had home field advantage in that series. And nobody showed up. Nobody showed up. At, you know, St. Petersburg continues to be kind of a, a bizarre baseball market. Uh, Florida continues to be a bizarre sports state that has very little interest outside of college sports. Um, but yeah, no Tampa Bay, I think they had, uh, they had gone like 30 or something consecutive innings without scoring in the postseason. Uh, yeah. And it went back to last season in the, the wild card series when they got knocked out by Cleveland. Um, but just a, yeah, disappointing, disappointing. Uh, Texas really came in. I think they got shut down by Evaldi and Montgomery. Montgomery went seven, seven innings in one of the games. Um, and they couldn't hit a bullpen from Texas that has been bad. Like Bochi does not have Bruce Bochi does not have a bullpen to work with, and they shut down the Rays. So, um, and they had one extra base hit too, um, as well, which is not not a very not, good show. Not going to get it done in the playoffs. Not going to get it done. Um, we we were though focused on this. Um, a few of us here, a few of the people that I've talked to, um we were focused a little bit on this Minnesota Toronto series. Um, did you see the game where, you know, there's the pickoff at second base with Sonny Gray and, and, you know, Vladimir Guerrero jr. There was that. And then in that same game, they went to the bullpen. Uh, John Schneider, the manager of the Toronto Blue Jays went to the bullpen, took out Jose Barrios, who was pitching very well and only had like 40 some odd pitches, but kind of a bizarre managerial, you know, showing right there yeah you know it's always i feel like you know you got to have probably a shorter hook in the playoffs because you can't let a game get away from you but that game wasn't away from from the jays yet and you know barrios got into a little bit of trouble i was surprised by that we know some jays fans who were, were not too happy with that decision um i did see the pickoff i mean it sounds like carlos correa kind of orchestrated that whole thing he noticed that the runners at second earlier in the game couldn't hear the base coach the third base coach uh because the crowd was so loud and so he kind of orchestrated it with uh sunny gray and the the catcher and i mean you just can't get picked off in that situation i don't think we need to tell anybody that but he's the tying run on second base he's the trail runner tough look to get picked there man yeah, just that was a winning play all the way around. And I think Kerry Crowley talked about this on his podcast, but like Cray didn't have a great year this year, or at least not a great year up in, you know, to matching his standards. But he's he makes plays like that for a reason. He's on, you know, he's he's sought after for a reason. And I think that's one of those plays. But uh back to the Blue Jays thing, real quick. Barrios had thrown three shutout innings. Uh, and then Schneider pulled him after I believe a leadoff walk which is four, three shutout innings. And the, I mean, let the guy cook, let the guy go in there and, and yeah. get his due at least, you know, way to even think about making a decision until the fifth inning. Um, you know, it's a game you have to win these wild card series. You can't like waste an inning at all. Uh, and it shocked me. I, I think I read that the GM of the blue Jays, Ross Atkins was also um, kind of surprised that John Schneider pulled him. Uh, and, I mean, when you make a decision like this in the postseason, it gets amplified. Look at Kevin Cash and Blake Snell. When you make a decision in the regular season, it doesn't blow up as much as in the postseason, which is obvious. But I didn't like that. I think he should have stayed in the game and you know to get more outs, especially after like forty pitches. And what are you saving him for? Possibly nothing, and it ended up you know being nothing. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and then, yeah, the other series just to touch on that was the, the Phillies and the Marlins. Uh, I don't know. I, not much of note there. I know Bryson Stott had a huge home run. Uh, that was really cool. They've done it a few times where they've taken the announcers out of the replays for big home runs this postseason. Um, and his home, what was really cool. I don't know if you saw the replay of his home run without the announcers was the whole crowd had just finished singing his walk up song. And first pitch, like right as they, the crowd finishes singing, you know, hits a bomb and the crowd just went ape. So uh, that was that was really cool to watch. But any thoughts on that series? 
Yeah, I think it was the uh, AO, AOK. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going to get taken down for copyrights now. Uh, but I, I think I saw a tweet where it said that um, that that shot right there, the one you're talking about, should be a commercial for MLB. Like just that entire thing put as a commercial. The, the Phillies fans singing, A-O, A-O, OK. And then Bryson Stott left on left hitting a homer. And he came up big in the postseason last year, too, when the Phillies really needed middle infield help and they got it from Bryson Stott. Like he's this is his second time, you know, playing in big games like he's he's becoming a really good player for them. And. Um, yeah, no, no thoughts on that series, Miami. It's it's a bummer that Sandy Alcantara, um, you know, wasn't available. But um, the Marlins have a bright future. I think Skip Schumacher did an excellent job in his first year managing that team. Um, we'll see them again. But um, yeah, no, the Phillies, the Phillies are on a roll, and I I can't wait to to talk more about them because they're just a a really good team. But yeah, wild card series went well, and um, like, should we move on to the division series? Yeah. So as you mentioned, all those wild card series were sweep. So the only bummer there was we had to go like two days without baseball because they have the third day open in case a, a wild card goes the, the distance. But uh, yeah, moving on to the division series, uh, I believe the Rangers were the first ones to advance there, uh, sweeping the Orioles. Um, you know, kind of a, a disappointment to a, a very successful season for the Orioles. They shocked a lot of people. I think they won 101 games. And they come up winless when it counts. Hats off. I mean, that's all you could say. Hats off to a really good or and they're they're a young team. Again, this is, you know, I mentioned the Marlins. Like the Orioles are gonna be back. There's no doubt about it. The Orioles are gonna be back. Um, and, and the thing that I get excited about them is, you know, they still have some young guys coming up. We've talked about Jackson Holiday, I think, on this show. And, you know, if they could combine this young core with maybe a few free agent signings here and there. Uh, over the next couple of off seasons, like the Orioles are going to be a threat in the American league for a long time. And this season was kind of their coming out party. We got to know Gunnar Henderson. Um, if, if we didn't know Adley Rutschman, we now know him for sure. Um, and their bullpen was nasty and they, they have young arms, Braddish impressed during the postseason. hats off to them, but Texas, man, they just, they kind of just barrel rolled them. They hit all they do is hit. Their pitching staff, it's kind of a makeshift pitching staff with free agents all over the place with Montgomery. John Gray is not hasn't pitched, but he's been a part of that all year. Um and Evaldi. Uh, uh, yeah, Valdi. Evaldi's just a big game pitcher. He's seems like he's in every yeah. postseason pitching like six scoreless or something. Yeah. But um and Bochi. Happy for Bochi. We're gonna yeah, Boach. happy. Yeah, not surprised that a, a Bochi bunch showed up when it when it matters in October. Um, then I guess to ra- to wrap up the AL, we can talk the Astros Twins. Uh, what were your thoughts on that series? I didn't watch a ton of Astros Twins. Uh, to be completely honest with you, I had my focus on a few of the other series that were going on. But um, whether we like it or not, like Houston, they got like it's a historic run that they've had. Like whether we like it or not, they are going on a run that we've never seen in terms of baseball. You know, it's, it's not a dynasty because they've only won two championships in this period. And one of them is, you know, tainted, I I guess, of course. Um, But at the same time, like you have to appreciate the way that they've built teams. You have to appreciate the way they play big in postseason. Um, And I think a lot of people this year, especially with the emergence of Texas and, I guess a little bit with Seattle too. They've kind of been counted out, I guess, as being the favorites, but I've always thought that, you know, the pennant still goes through Houston and it still will this year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're going to have to, the the battle of Texas is going to be interesting for sure. Uh, Yeah. I didn't watch a whole lot of that series either. I know uh, Jordan Alvarez had a pretty big series as he seems to tend to do every uh, postseason. Uh, you know, and and the twins, I mean, they kind of played like a, a 84, 85 win team. Um, so yeah, the the ALCS, which we'll get into in a minute, will be uh will be interesting for sure. Uh pivoting over to the National League, we'll save the juiciest series for last. So the the D backs made a lot of people here in Northern California happy by sweeping the Dodgers. Uh we'll we'll get into the Dodgers specifically in a little bit, but uh what were your thoughts on on how that series unfolded? Yeah, no, just they just didn't 
their, their pitching didn't give them a chance to win. Like that's all there is to it. Their pitching didn't give them a chance to win. Their offense didn't, their, their core guys didn't give them a chance to win, but I focus on the pitching, to be honest with you. They didn't, I, the first two games, they couldn't even get through two innings combined with those guys with Kershaw and Bobby Miller. And, um, you know, eventually, you know, you had to realize at some point you can't get through a postseason series, a short one or a long one with what they were throwing out there on the mound. Uh, it wasn't working, but for Arizona's credit, you know, they, they, they were in first place for a lot of the season this year. And then the Dodgers got hot, caught up a little bit and Arizona snuck into the postseason. and they just bring an interesting level of, of speed and defense and versatility on the field. And how did they beat the Dodgers in that final game against Lance Lynn? They hit the home run. So like, yeah. it's not just that they play small ball. It's not that, you know, just that they, they make plays in the outfield Their outfields insane with their defense, but they also have, have shown that they could hit home runs. And I don't know about you, but I, I, as much as I like watching talent on some of the same teams every year in the postseason, I like seeing kind of a change in, in direction here with Arizona getting a chance and that fan base getting a chance to, experience this uh this series coming up here but um yeah it's it's for giants fans like you mentioned it's kind of like a tradition now watching uh them go home usually empty-handed there was 2020 but you know it's the the covid season doesn't mean the same for a lot of people but uh definitely a, a really fun and entertaining i've fallen in love with this diamondbacks team i really have they're they're a good bunch yeah, I mean, uh, their bullpen was a lot nastier than I had realized that it was during the regular season. And just a lot of homegrown talent there, too. I mean, a lot of guys that they've helped kind of cultivate and bring up through their system. And now they're seeing the benefits of that. And, you know, we talked about the the Marlins a little bit, saying they'll be back to Orioles. They'll be back. You know, the, the, the D-backs are playing ahead of schedule for where a lot of people thought they'd be, too. And so... You know, it, it's it's cool to see some some of these teams that aren't, you know, traditional contenders. You know, you don't think of them every October that have kind of put in the work to build up these these rosters. And now they're reaping the benefits. They there might be a little bit of a an, uh, some some trouble when they get past Gallon and Kelly in that like. You know, I, I don't know the guy's name. I think I, I don't know how to pronounce it, at least the guy that started game three for them. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just. Their pitching depth, like that's why I kind of thought that they would be good for like a Jordan Montgomery type at the deadline. Um, and that they need to get someone with Gallon. Uh Mary Kelly definitely could be a big game pitcher. He showed it in LA, but you know, maybe in a in a seven game series, which the championship series is, they might need a little extra oomph there in that rotation. And I don't know if they have it. So that would be the only downside for me. Um, you know, but at the same time, um, I'm very, very enriched and encouraged by their play. Absolutely. Uh, and then, like I said, saving the juiciest series for last, they don't, kind of the only series I feel like that we've had any kind of uh, drama or, you know, was the uh, the Phillies and Braves, the AL East rivals, lock and horns. Uh, it was entertaining, I'll say that, but I'm surprised that the Braves just – you know, got bounced so soon because they have kind of a modern day murderer's row in their lineup. Yeah. They, they, I mean, they're a team that, that, like you said, like historic lineup, like, you know, guys that you could just pencil in there every day in the same spot. And we don't see a lot of that often. And I think that's why they're so intriguing to watch. And they're pitching too. Like it's kind of similar to, to what the Dodgers had endured too. Like the Dodgers did not have, Dustin May, they did not have Julio Arias. They did not have a healthy or efficient or good Clayton Kershaw. Um, you know, they they lost out on all those starters. And for the Braves, Max Fried came back, right? But he was dealing with a blister. Borden had the hand injury. Spencer Strider was kind of like your only guy. I know Bryce Elder kind of got lit up a little bit. Um, but there were some exceptional like defensive plays in that series. Um you know, and I think My, the Michael I, Harris, holy cow, what a play. Like that was an insane yeah. play. Um, center field, you know, taking extra bases away, presumably. And then Austin Riley too had a big yeah. home run in that game and made that play backing up. Oh, he's back up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was an incredible play, but well, he even had a big, uh, Harris had a big catch yesterday, you know, making a, a diving catch to, to hold the Phillies from scoring some more too. I mean, his, 
his glove was on full display for the whole series, but obviously, yeah, that game ender was kind of the, the one that everyone's going to think about for a long time. Yeah. And like the postseason is made for plays like that. Um, you know, or you could even make the argument like guys like Michael Harris, guys like, you know, making that play, they're made for the postseason. So you could you go either way with that, but an incredible play, there was drama. And I, I have a lot of stock into the announcing the, the call of an announcer. And I thought Brian Anderson did a really good job with that. That's a tough play because yeah. you have to focus on the play in center field and you have to focus on how far the base runner is going too. Um, and for Brian Anderson on TBS, I think he, he nailed the call and there was a lot of yelling, but I, I think it ended up being a really, really good thing. So to visit that play for a second, did you yeah. have, obviously you don't want to get doubled off there, but do you have any issue with Harper kind of going all out like it was going to fall? Yeah, I've seen this question presented. Um, no, not at yeah. all. Not at all. I think the game was going to be over anyways. I didn't think the uh, the Phillies were going to score in that inning because um, it still would have been a guy at first base. Guy um, at first, two outs. I mean, that ball falling was their best chance to tie the game up in that inning. Uh, 100%. So, you know – one thing I like about Bryce Harper is no matter what, he's going to give it his all. And he obviously, you know, the ball got caught and so he got doubled off, but Hey, if that ball drops, people are going to talk about how Harper read the ball and scored from first. And it was a hell of a catch. I think it had like a 40% catch probability <laughs> off the bat. So I didn't have any issues with it. Obviously it just didn't go the way he wanted, but kind of where the, the bulletin board material came in uh, that I mentioned came as a result of that play uh, Orlando Arcia of the Braves, uh, yelling, uh, at a boy Harper in the, in the clubhouse after the game, some reporters were there and, and reported it, uh, as their job description entails. And, uh, that kind of lit a fire under the Phillies. Yeah, th this was a, this has kind of been the talk of baseball, right? Um, the, this whole, this whole topic about, Orlando Arcia saying attaboy Harper attaboy Harper kind of in a mocking tone and and like you said a reporter heard it and reported it and we'll get I uh, we'll, we'll get to the ethics part in a second but just in terms of how it motivated Harper like we saw it oh yeah <laughs> like I'm always encouraged and I'm always like like kind of in a way like I'm I'm intrigued with the way people get different things to pump them up right everybody has a way of getting themselves hyped for a game everybody has has things that that give them drive and like for bryce harper and for his career and i want to get to it and just i don't want to take what i'm going to say later on but he's defied the odds and he's lived up to expectation his whole life um i guess maybe those two aren't parallel because how do you live up to expectation and defy the odds at the same time whatever um but from a journalism standpoint, like the reporter did the right thing, right? I mean, it, it's something that happened. Your job as a reporter, this is something that I've been taught in journalism school. Your job is to report on what's happening. And the reason media is in the clubhouse is to report on stuff that people at home don't know and to relay the information. You're simply the messenger. And Orlando Arcia was not saying this in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody else. He was not saying it in a small group of other players he, well, it was described in the reporting, he was yelling. He was yelling, attaboy Harper, attaboy yeah. Harper. And other In a room full of reporters and cameras. And cameras. Like, and if you listen back on those cameras, like, they're going to have it, right? Um, and, and, like, the media, the media is not, they don't work for the team. They're not supposed to hide information like the team might hide information. When the media availability is open, that is a me yeah, that's the media's right to go in there and report uh, what you see, what you hear. We are the documenters of history here. And it got out, it got out, right? Of course, Orlando Arcia doesn't want that to get out. But if he didn't want that to get out, he should not have said it in that setting. Um, and, um, you know, in, in terms of the, the reporter that reported it, Jake Mintz of Fox Sports, who does a really good job, who has been writing baseball all year. And Jake got unfairly unfairly just completely unfairly you know criticized about this he did his job um and he's not just some podcaster or some new media person that's getting into this jake has worked very hard at promoting baseball and a lot of people see him as one of the most creative minds in the game and 
for Alana Rizzo of MLB Network to come at him like she did. And I don't know if I want to play the quote or not, play the clip or not, but it was unprofessional and it was not called for. And everybody's trying their hardest at this media thing. Jake does a good job of it. And he was simply doing his job and um, just a weird, you know, and it sucks that Harper, it got back to Harper. It sucks for Arcia, but at the same time, being aware of your surroundings, understanding that in the postseason there's more media, you have to understand it. So yeah, you have um, to know your surroundings. And, and I think that really did turn the series, not just for firing up Harper and maybe yeah. some of his teammates. Cause Nick Cassianos went wild after that too. Um, it got in Arcia's head a lot. I mean, the, the, the team and the the fans in Philly, not surprisingly with how passionate they are, they got all behind the attaboy Harper. They all like they were wearing shirts and stuff and there's videos behind the Braves dugout. Uh, did you see the videos of Arcia from I did. You know, the fans are chirping at him and he, I, I haven't seen many players act like that at all, where he's actually like turning and engaging and like Ronald Acuna Jr. had to try to like keep him on the rail instead of turning around and yelling at the fans. So, you know, you know, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. And they got in his head and, and now the Braves are going to watch the uh, NLCS like we will. And the thing about off the record conversation in the big league clubhouse and Stephanie Epstein of ESPN, who's one of the national baseball, right. Or not ESPN, excuse me. Uh, Sports illustrated did an awesome job at this at describing what off the record is and off the record, you know, a manager could tell you something ahead of time and say, this is going to be off the record, but blah, 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 blah. Um, or a player could say afterwards, Hey, can that be off the record? And then at that point, it's the reporter's job to decide what they do with it. But other than that, everything's on the record. You know, everything, right. everything that is said when the media is in the room is on the record, unless told or asked otherwise, you know, that's just how it works. Um, you know, it, it helps to give depth to different stories that go on. Yeah. Um, Qu question for you on that. Cause I've never been in an NLB clubhouse as a member of the media. I'm sure most of our listeners haven't either. Why would something be off the record? Is it just like kind of build some trust and some goodwill with the reporters? Like I'm going to give you some information, but you can't share it with anybody, but we want to kind of look, give you a, in tune on what's going on. Is it more just relationship and trust building? I think it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both. Anything off the record, any information that's used off the record cannot be shared anywhere. Um, could not even be used as background in an article. Some players will request to go like anonymous, right? We've seen that before in different things where, you know, one player said this and this and this. Um, or someone's not... playing card games in the clubhouse, you know, they might yeah, be off the record. Exactly. Um, yeah. But so sometimes it's, you know, you have to, you know, give them the anonymous voice i guess but yeah it's off the record is kind of an interesting thing but for the most part if it's said in the clubhouse and you don't you were not you know it was not said beforehand or you know after the fact off the record then it's open game and even if so it sounds like even if it's afterwards it's up to the reporter on if they want to grant that request so the yeah. only way to like kind of guarantee it is say this is off the record and then the reporter kind of verbalizes that they agree to that and then they spill yeah. the tea yeah, but if a if a player says something, you know, to a reporter and then afterwards said, "Hey, by the way, can that be on the record?" it's up to the reporter because you were initially on the record, right? Yeah. Um and then you probably realized you might have said some weird <laughs> shit and then you know, trying to cover your tracks a little bit. So yeah. uh it's an interesting thing. It's tricky. I can understand why the Braves are uncomfortable about it. I it, I I don't want to fault the Braves, but at the same time you have to be aware. You have to be, you have to understand the media's job and the media is important because they are the ones that get the story out about baseball. They're the ones who are trying to, you know, not necessarily, you know, public relations wise, pump up the game and put more eyes on the game, but they are kind of, you know, they're trying to inform about baseball and, and about how great this sport is. And you want the media on your side. Cause if you don't, it's trouble. It's going to be trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, but aside from that, you know, that's been a focal point of the series, but Wheeler and Nola were dominating. Uh, like I said, I think Cassianos had a couple multi home run games. Harper went off after that. Uh, Real Muto was hitting bombs. Turner was hitting bombs. So they are seem to be firing on all cylinders going off to the next series. Yeah, definitely. They, they, I mean, Cassianos is a big game player. Uh, Schwarber's a big game player. The Phillies are just full of these guys that just have ice water in their veins and, 
Wheeler Nola, man. That's a pretty good one two punch there. Um, and just a really deep lineup. So I'm I'm looking forward to see what they could do um against Arizona. Uh if we're talking about the the league championship series, I think that's gonna be a fun series. Um and this is, you know, these are two teams that have had kind of some drama in the regular season. I don't know if you've seen on your timeline, there's been some some arguments between the two sides, some bad blood just a little bit um, during incidents during the regular season. So hopefully we get more of that. To be honest, I'm cheering for it. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, yeah, we need some more. We were talking about this a little bit before we hopped on. There hasn't been a lot of drama or not a lot of uh, suspense in this postseason. You know, like we said, all the wild cards ended in sweeps two division series ended in sweeps. The other two only went four. So hopefully we get some, some good, uh, you know, baseball drama and some series that can go a little deeper here as we get through the postseason. Some game sevens. Yeah. We need some game, game sevens. sevens. Yeah. Yeah. So the next time that that can happen is of course the league championship series. We kind of set the table there. So uh, ALCS, we got the Astros and the Texas Rangers, the good old Bochy versus Dusty Baker matchup that a lot of Giants fans are looking forward to. What do you what are you thinking here, man? This is this is really big for for the state of Texas. You know, this is cool for the two managers that have Giants ties and the two managers that are in the same division and the two managers that are older and are you know have the old school feel to them. It's it's cool. Uh, if I'm gonna make a prediction though, I, I think I think Texas is on a roll right now that is just so significant the way they're hitting. They, you know, once you get into the postseason and Texas is a wild card team, they got in at the right time, they got hot in this postseason. And I think they're gonna ride that wave. I think they're gonna score runs. I think they're gonna pitch good. I'm worried a little bit about the bullpen, but at the same time, Bruce Bochi, it's very tough to bet against him in postseason. Very tough to bet against him. He lost the division series in 2016. That was the last postseason series that he lost. And he doesn't lose a whole lot after, after the division series. Once it's, you know, once he's in the league championship series, he's done pretty well. And I, I like this Texas team a lot. Um, but at the same time, the, the American league pennant once again is going through Houston. Yeah. I mean, Houston has that experience, you know, they have a lot of guys who have been there before they even, you know, they got Verlander back after he had left. Um, so, you know, it'll kind of be the, you know, can the, the team that hasn't been there before stay hot or does the team with the, you know, that background able to pull through, I think one wild card in that series could be Bochy's kind of opened the door that Max Scherzer might return at some point in this series, which, you know, maybe it's out of the pen at some point, but you know, if he's healthy, if you can pull a Max Scherzer out of your back pocket, that could be uh, something that swings the series. I I just checked my phone. I just glanced at it just for a split second, and I just saw the Bleacher Report um, update that said Max Scherzer says he's ready to go for the Rangers in the 2023 ALCS amid injury. And, of course, the injury that he had was a muscle strain in his shoulder, uh, but he says he's ready to go for Sunday. Yeah, I mean, you, you, it looked like he was healthy during some of those uh... – clubhouse celebrations he was enjoying it more than just about anyone it looked like and uh also kind of just funny to look back you know beginning of the year we talked about how the Mets might be a team to beat and they had just signed Verlander and Scherzer and now both of those guys are playing in the American League yeah. Championship Series um did you see Verlander's speech yeah he's like I uh, wasn't even here <laughs> I, I don't think we can play the clip of that uh <laughs> of, of that speech there was a lot of uh, colorful language but uh Hey, I mean, both those guys have been around a long time and one of them's going to get a chance to go after another ring. Yeah. And another ring. I always forget that, that I know obviously Verlander has one Verlander has two. Um, and for a long time, it was that he wasn't a good postseason pitcher and Scherzer has the one of course with Washington, which I always forget about. I, the 2019 world series is one that I forget about quite a bit. Yeah. Which I shouldn't. Scherzer's just been kind of one of those guys. I, it's amazing how many teams he's played for. He always, I, I mean, he was in the World Series with Detroit, uh, you know, and then to Washington, and then he got traded to the Dodgers when they were, you know, supposed to go deep in the playoffs. He's just one of those guys that always just seems to find himself in the playoffs. He's only gotten the ring once, but he might have a chance for a, a second. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. Um, yeah, I, I like, I, I definitely want to see what kind of workload Scherzer gets, and with it being the postseason, maybe it's like a mix of like, we don't want to pitch this guy too far. And also, 
He walked a guy to lead off the inning, you know, stuff like that. So I think it's going to play into it, but we might see him twice in the series. So whatever, whatever workload will get him ready for another game in that series, then I think that's what they're going to do. For sure. So yeah, that we'll get into, uh, we'll make a world series matchup prediction at the uh, end of this topic. So let's move over to the NLCS, the Phillies and D backs. Uh, I mean, this could be a really interesting series. I could see it ending really quickly or going really deep because, you know, both these teams have shown that you can either get really hot or really cold, uh, but they're both riding waves coming into the, the series. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get into some of the, the series layoffs in a bit, but, you know, also both these teams are going to be coming off a three, four, five day break because they don't play. The NLCS doesn't start until Monday. So... Yeah. Yeah. It's, this is an interesting one because like you said, I could see it ending two ways also, but Arizona has got to play well on the road. I feel like that's my main takeaway is you gotta, you gotta go in the citizens bank park and silence that crowd. It won't be easy because that crowd's loud. They're often, you know, hostile. It's a hostile environment, which has been described by many players and the diamondbacks are kind of a new at this in terms of the group that they have right now. Um, that's my key for Arizona, to be honest with you. That and and also get through, you know, Kelly. You know, you got to get innings from Kelly and and Gallon. There's no ands if buts about yeah. it. You got to get innings from those guys because if you don't, I think you're screwed. You almost have to win the game. You almost have to win the games. So those guys start too because yeah. you can't bank on winning with the other guys. You might be able to squeak one out, but you can't bank on it. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, I think they'll have to play like the D-backs against the Dodgers, and not the D-backs against the Brewers, because, like I mentioned earlier, they fell down early in both of those Brewers games. You know, Milwaukee's a great town. I'm sure the crowd was loud, but Philly gets to a whole nother level, especially once they get this deep in the postseason. So, if you get that crowd going, it's going to be hard to uh, to bring the volume down there. Yeah, and another thing is, and and this goes for the Rangers too, and if we're going to combine them a little bit with this thing I'm about to say out, whoever's going to out Homer, you know, the other team's going to win. You know, that's yeah. usually how it goes in postseason. If you out Homer, the other team and Texas has hit a lot of them. Uh, the Phillies have hit a lot of them. Um, whoever out homers, the other team's going to win and whoever scores first is going to win. That's just going to, that's just kind of how it works. But um, these are, these are two really good series. Should we make a pick? Yeah, let's make a pick. Who, who, who's playing for the uh the world series here in about a week and a half the texas rangers appear in their first world series with bruce bochi at the helm texas rangers with vengeance facing off against the philadelphia phillies texas rangers phillies phillies and diamondbacks go seven games uh the rangers beat the Astros in five games. Wow. Yeah. So they just take it to their cross state rival. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, in my mind, I'm going with the same matchup. Um, I'm, I could see the Phillies knocking out the D backs. Actually, I'm going to actually flip on you a little bit. I think the Phillies are going to win in five. And I think the, the, Texas series, Texas Houston is going to go seven. Um, it's not necessarily what I want. It's what I think. I think, you know, that, like you said, the D backs are a fun team. They're easy to kind of fall in love with. Um, but I just don't see, you know, maybe one or two guys cool off for the Phillies, but I don't see like all the, you know, all those guys that I mentioned earlier, real Muto Harper, Cassianos Turner, you know, they're going to be able to, to score some runs. And I just, as much as they'll need to win when, gallon and merrill kelly are throwing i just don't see them out dueling nola and wheeler enough to to get there so uh so yeah i guess we're both going texas philadelphia which means in a couple of weeks we'll see a houston arizona world series probably heck yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> heck yeah we're all gonna we're gonna get proved wrong so quick it's gonna be great <laughs> But uh, yeah, so, you know, it would be interesting to see who we have in the World Series here in a couple of weeks. Uh, there has been some news outside of baseball. This time of year, it's typically the, the managerial carousel that kind of starts spinning. Uh, right now, there's four guaranteed openings. The Guardians with, uh, with Francona retiring, uh, 
the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim near Disneyland in Orange County, let Phil Nevin go. The Giants, of course, releasing uh, Gabe Kapler from his contractual obligations and the Mets and Showalter uh, splitting ways. Uh, also, I, I put on our, you know, Dodgers. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Roberts is looking for work as well. Um, but, you know, as you're looking at these teams looking for a new manager, is there anything that sticks out? Any kind of uh, any kind of take here? Yeah, I feel like each position's like a little bit different. Like, you know, the Brewers might also be on a list that needs a manager. Uh, Craig Council's on the last year of his deal. But like the Angels, they just need somebody in there that, you know, could could just be there, right? I, I don't I don't even know if it's like a long term solution at this point. They're still trying to build up their organization. Um, with the Mets, like ideally, you probably want a guy who's going to be in there with experience, who's going to win now. Um, and whether that's a Craig Council with David Stearns, uh, with the Guardians, again, it's a it's a young team, uh, a team that has shown to take advantage in a in a load in a not loaded the opposite of loaded in a very mediocre historically American league central. Like whenever the, the central is weak, usually the twins or the uh, guardians are the ones to take advantage of that. So, um, and with the giants, like probably just a different voice. Um, maybe somebody who does have experience, someone from outside the organization, they've made some internal, um, noise with interviewing Mark Hallberg recently. Uh, but I think at the same time, uh, you know, more experienced or, you know, more experienced someone from outside the organization would be a better fit, but I love the managerial carousel. I think it's fun. I like when, when, you know, we start hearing the list of candidates that come out, there's some good ones out there, some bright baseball people. Um, but sometimes these manager things don't age. Well, you get basically hired to be fired and that's kind of what's happened. Yeah, I mean, they always kind of, you know, a couple of these are basically retirements with Francona and essentially show Walter retiring. And some of them are just, you know, you have to be the fall guy because you can't release all your players. They're under contract. And so you kind of just become the the poster child for what went wrong. Uh, and one thing just to touch on for the Giants, you know, they have talked about that they want to get a guy who can almost be like a recruiter <laughs> to, to help bring guys in, someone who got uh, players would like to play for and who can kind of help uh, seal the deal to get some guys to come to San Francisco. So yeah, it'll be really interesting. You know, I don't really usually look at trying to predict who's going to go where until I see who they're talking to, because there's so many names that could potentially be going to these places. So it'll be interesting to see how it, how it turns out, you know, most, you know, we essentially named six teams here. If we throw the Brewers in, you know, four of those five actually i'm gonna say five five of those are you know teams that perennially like they annually are saying that their goal is to make the playoffs i mean that's every team's goal but guardians like you said in that central giants you know they have the capabilities to get there the mets dodgers and brewers you know dodgers and brewers were in the postseason this year so you know it's going to be interesting to see and like you said they're all a little different they're all not looking for necessarily the same just big names so it'll be interesting to see kind of the the type of guys that they target. Yeah, no doubt about it. I agree. And, you know, some of these guys could be transitional candidates, right? Some of them could be there for the long haul because Terry Francona was in Cleveland for a long time. Um, and Craig council was in, you know, is in Milwaukee for a long time. And some of the teams have the opposite show Walter only a few years, Phil Nevin, like a year and a half, maybe. Right. Um, so yeah. yeah. Probably uh, they're all different. You know, I, I wonder which job is the most appealing to some of these managers that are out there. And uh, it's definitely a, an interesting conversation to have. Yeah. We'll, we'll probably have a little more to talk about there. Like I said, when we see who some of these teams are targeting and uh, yeah, maybe we'll uh, have some ideas because usually they try to lock up their manager early in the off season so that the players who they're trying to sign know who they're going to be playing for. So typically it doesn't draw out as far as, you know, some of these free agency deals go. So yeah, would be helpful. <laughs> yeah. So next up, Steven, I have a surprise topic for you just because I saw there's a lot of, uh, you know, this time of year, you get to see a lot of like, Oh, on this date, you know, 20 years ago, or on this date, five years ago. And today there's a couple historic ones. Today is the 22nd anniversary already of, do you want to guess? So 22 years ago would be 2001. Since I'm yeah. 21 years old, 2001 in October, um, the Jeter flip play 
the Jeter flip play 22 years ago today in Oakland. And then uh, see if you can guess the second one. And my goal of the topic wasn't to have you guess, but let's see if you can do it. Uh, 10 years ago. Okay. 10 years ago would be 2000. And by the way, the Jeter flip play, I saw the highlight before I came to school. So, but I had to remember <laughs> for a second. 10 years ago would have been 2000, uh, uh, 2013. Um, I don't think it would have been the World Series yet. No, it is a CS. Okay, St. Louis was in the World Series against the Red Sox. Who did St. Was it was it a Kershaw blow up? It was not. It was the the big poppy grand slam in Game Two. They were down in the series, one nothing already in Fenway, uh, bottom of the eighth, two down. They were down by four because uh, Scherzer actually started that game, shut them down. And uh, I think it was Joaquin Benoit gave up a, Joaquin Benoit. a grand slam to Big Poppy to light up Fenway. It was the play where Tory Hunter flew over the wall and there was the cop in the background cheering. <laughs> um, so the reason I brought up this topic is, you know, like I said, you know, some of these big moments. Are there any kind of postseason memories or replays or, you know, specific plays that you remember that or that you kind of look forward to seeing the anniversary of every year? Well, there's way too many of them, but I, I think just because we're on the topic of that 2013 World Series or the 2013 postseason, um, I was spending the night at a buddy's house. I was in 2013. I probably would have been in fifth grade, maybe oh fifth or gosh. sixth grade. Uh, and we watched uh, one of the games of the postseason, and it was the game where Alan Craig tripped over Will Middlebrooks at third base, and they called obstruction to end the game. Oh, and yeah. We, I remember it like it was lodged in my brain only because um, one of my friends goes to sleep with the TV on. And for whatever reason, like I can't ever do that. Like I, everything has to be dark and it was on MLB network. And what MLB network does in the postseason is they just keep replaying the MLB tonight post game show. So, and I couldn't fall asleep. So I heard about that Middlebrooks play probably three separate times, like three separate hours <laughs> The same thing was said. I'm like, oh, God, here we go again. It felt like Groundhog Day. Um, but, yeah, that, that was a crazy play, crazy way to end that game. And I think in the same series, Colton Wong got picked off first to end the game in St. Louis by Koji Uehara um, and Mike Napoli applied the tag. Um, that, like, that was back when, like, I felt like I know – because I, I used to collect a lot of baseball cards back in those days. And that's, like, how I really got to know the players – and like now there's so many guys that like don't play every day, some platoon guys, some young guys coming up like that, like 2013, 14, 15. That's like when I knew every single bullpen, every single rotation, every single lineup um, and, and just some some recognizable players. So is that where you fill out most of your immaculate grid from? Is that uh, pretty much era? <laughs> that's there? Like early 2010s was pretty much like the one that I feel like I knew the player and like, maybe I should collect baseball cards now. Maybe it's a wake up call for me to start collecting like more cards. I know the players obviously now, but not as much with certainty because of all the movement, but there's oh, so many postseason moments yeah. that come to mind. Yeah. I'll just throw a couple out there. I mean, I got to throw one giant. I always look forward to November 1st every year. Cause that yeah. was when the giants won their first ring in 2010, but also just like another team's play that I always just think of when I get to October is uh, Albert Pujols absolutely murdering a baseball against Brad Lidge. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's landed yet. Um, but yeah, it was game five of the 2005 NLCS. I know that was before your time as a baseball fan. I guess before your time as much of a person, you were like four, I guess. But uh, have but, you heard Lidge's story about that? Yeah. So I think you sent it to me. The the pilot. On yeah. The plane. Yeah. <laughs> um but yeah so i mean that was just a huge home run uh it was like 450 something feet over the train tracks in houston because this was when houston was still in the national league uh they've b- bounced around a little bit but yeah the, that anecdote that uh, steven was talking about you know after the game after they lost the astros were kind of bummed they had to fly to st louis to play and uh the i think it was was it brad osmus asked the pilot to like so they were after they had taken off. Yeah, uh, I think the pilot was saying like on the right hand side you see the great state of this and this, and on the left hand side there's the ball that Albert Pujols hit. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, so it's kind of a good way to kind of lighten the mood in, on the flight, I'm sure. Uh, Brad Lidge said, you know, it kind of made him laugh and help him get past it. But uh, that's something that I always think of just because, I mean, it was, and not the timing of it, it was just such a huge, huge home run. Was that 05 or 06? That was 05. So uh, Houston ended up getting the better the better of, of uh, St. Louis in that series because they went into the World Series. Yeah. So- Brad Lidge had the last laugh some way, somehow. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that was just a fun topic. You know, I saw the, the Jeter and the Poppy highlights today uh, and it just made me think of, uh, you know, just some cool plays. It's always cool this time of year just to, you know, there are so many of them on Twitter and Instagram and yeah. whatnot. So it's and, cool uh, kind of- and Tom Brenneman had a great call. Derek Jeter with one of the <laughs> most unbelievable plays you will ever see. Yeah. Yeah. And- and to be honest, uh, the not to that he didn't travel as far, but that Austin Riley backup on the play, same the awareness, end, yeah. same awareness. You know, they showed the kind of those uh, digital replays of you know it's not the actual player, but you see them move and you see him kind of like raise his hand like first, first, and then the throw starts coming in and the little stick figure just starts running across the diamond. And if he's not there, you know the game's still going. They probably hold on to win, but you never know. He is able to close the deal for him. So have you seen those stick figures? Like when a guy gets ejected, or they strike out and they throw the bat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, those are always uh, funny. Yeah, um, but yeah. Oh, so awesome. thank you for that. That good, good times. Yeah, surprise topic for you there. And so uh, that brings us to three up, three down to close out episode thirty-three. I think do we continue with the trend? It's three up, three down, but we'll start with the downs so we can end on an up. That yeah, for go you? for it. So uh, my I'm I'm the downs this week. So my first down is teams with a buy not named the Houston Astros. So that would be the Dodgers, Braves, Orioles. Uh, no team with more than 90 wins still remaining. There's been a lot of chatter around baseball of do they need to change the the format if you know the best teams aren't showing up or aren't you know they're saying that the buy is detrimental to them. And I'm I don't buy that. I mean, you're major league baseball players. You can stay. If you can't stay focused for a postseason series, then that's on you. Uh, that's my take on it. And I also don't want them to change the format because, like we said earlier, we don't need more baseball teams in the playoffs. But, uh, yeah, that's my first down. What are, your, what are your thoughts on that one? Yeah, just to be brief, like, I understand the the not – like, the, the players not liking it. And to a certain to a certain extent, I think it's too long, too. But at the same time, I agree. I don't want anything to change, and you got to I mean, deal with it. Yeah, yeah. If they gave the teams the pick, okay, you can either take a buy or you can choose your first round opponent. Maybe they do that. But like, what team is going to yeah. say, okay, we want to have to win more games to get to the World Series? Nobody. I don't like it, but I also think it should not be used as an excuse. I think that's total BS, and fans and players and organizations need to stop using it because um, that's not why you lost. That's yeah. my thought on it. Yeah. Uh, down number two, we touched on it briefly earlier talking about the Marlins, but Sandy Alcan- Alcantara, uh, having the Tommy John. So he's going to miss all of the 2024 season. It's like we said, the Marlins are a fun young team. They'll probably be back, but they're gonna have to do it next year without their ACE who won the Cy Young last year. So that's a, that's a big blow to a young team. Yeah. It seems like every now and then we have just a guy getting a pitcher getting hurt on one of these downs um and yeah. it just he just didn't seem like the guy that he was last season when he won the Cy Young and um you know still still got in a good workload uh, 184 and two-thirds innings pitched um uh, and still you know pitched deep in the games but uh not the same in terms of limiting runs but hopefully he comes back right uh he is still you know I think baseball and the Marlins are are much much better when they have him as their ace so sucks to hear and hopefully uh there's a fast recovery for for Sandy. Yeah. Thoughts and prayers to Charlie Baldwin. Yeah, um, of course. <laughs> uh, and then it brings me so much joy to say down number three is the Los Angeles Dodgers. I mean, if you watched, uh, I w- got to watch some of game three and Bob Costas just talked about how much of a disappointment this Dodger season was uh, for like two or three innings straight. Uh, I mean, like you mentioned the starters, obviously, you know, Kershaw Miller, uh, Lynn with his historic inning, uh, obviously didn't show up. He, they didn't put their team in a place to win. They were always in comeback mode, but also like you know, Betts, Freeman, Muncie, Martinez, they all had over a hundred RBIs on the season. I think they had one RBI combined in that series. I think it was a Martinez solo shot in game two. So, I mean, when your starters aren't performing and your core of your lineup is hitting in one run in a series, you're not going to win a lot of games. And then also, like we mentioned, you know, 
Dodgers for the man- managerial op- openings. You know, Dave Roberts is probably going to come under some heat here. We'll see if it uh, if the stove burns too hot that he's out there. Like I said, though, I think that's just a typical fall guy thing. I mean, he's managed them to be in position to win every year. And, you know, he has the same lineup. It's the players who weren't performing. So, unfortunately, I think I think he'll probably be looking for work. I think the Dodgers are going to be like, we need to do something. Um, so, Wow, that's actually kind of bold. You, you, don't, you think he's going to stay? I do. I, I do think he's going to stay. And um, but, but I do agree. Like, I mean, they, they should be labeled as – you know, the downs here, I mean, Betts and Freeman did practically nothing in the series. And, um, you know, I, I, I think Bob Costas at time, I think the game might've passed him by, you know, at this point, but I really enjoyed him this postseason um, and, and listening to him kind of describe the Dodgers downfall. Um, and yeah, just Turner and, or uh, sorry, not Turner. That was last year. Uh, Freeman and Betts didn't do anything this postseason and didn't work mm-hmm. out. Yeah, Mookie's struggles are prolific at this point. I yeah. think he's and he even like, said, yeah, he even said yeah. that I let them down. He's like three for thirty-eight or thirty-nine now, uh, going back to the twenty twenty-one NLCS. But yeah, uh, yeah so uh, Los Angeles Dodgers uh, down number three. So let's end it on a high note. Stephen, give us some ups. Ah. Oh, sorry, oh, okay. a high note. Okay, uh, my, so my ears are bleeding. Um, okay, I'll end it on an actual high note. Number one is going to be Royce Lewis, and this is kind of one out of nowhere, but like I was very quick to put him on this list only because he only played in 58 games during the regular season, and when he played, he was an extremely big part of the Twins' offense, and he's a former first overall pick by the Twins in 2017. It's been a long road. He's had some injuries, but he's still two, uh, 24 years old, um, you know, a California kid. And the reason I'm putting him up is because he had a very good, very good postseason, uh, but most mostly you know, very good wild card series against the Blue Jays. He really carried them with two home runs in the series. Um, and those were his only two hits, but he went two for six. But I want to give him credit for those those two home runs. He's worked hard and I see him. This is my time to give him props for upcoming years because I see him as a gigantic difference maker for the Minnesota twins moving forward. And he didn't hit as well in the uh, division series against Houston. He was only uh, three for 16, but he did have two homers. Uh, but, but I, I see him as being a big contributor down the road for Minnesota. Yeah. It seemed like any time he got a hit, it was a home run, but I, I think he's going to be one of the guys from this postseason where it kind of put him on the map where, yeah. you know, most, you know, just well, passing the you know, yeah. yeah, like in a Rosarena, like uh, Jordan Alvarez uh, was the last year, kind of just blew up. Or, so now I think most, you know, just, you know, casual baseball fans, if they watch the playoffs, they're going to know who Royce Lewis is next year now. So hopefully he can stay healthy. He's kind of gotten banged up on his way through the minors, even to get to Minnesota. And like you said, 58 games this year, I think you said. So hmm. if he can stay healthy, he's he's fun to watch. He could be a difference maker for the for the Twins. No doubt. And my number two guy, Ever since he was a teenager, Bryce Harper has been viewed upon as the next best thing. And, you know, with those expectations comes a lot of responsibility. And Bryce Harper, early in his career, like, you know, there are questions about his attitude. And here we are. He's 30 years old. And he has lived up to every single part of the hype. Every single part of the hype. He's a two-time MVP. He's got seven all-star game appearances. And it's hard to say anything other than the fact that he has ice water in his veins. When the moment is big, he comes up and just look at the RC incident, right? It got him fired up and he responded with two home runs. And that's the thing we're learning about Bryce Harper. And I think that will eventually end up in his legacy is Bryce Harper is becoming the guy who always responds and the match with him in Philly, as much as the giants, you know, were second in, you know, with getting him, The match with Bryce Harper and the Philadelphia Phillies is one of the best free agent matches in the history of baseball. I don't know if that's a hot take or not, but that is, that is a hundred percent what I think. He loves that city. The city loves him. It's not even looked at as cocky anymore, right? There, maybe he was cocky a little bit in the beginning, but it's, it's a quiet confidence, a, a guy who's a leader, who's a feisty leader, and he's doing everything he can do to lead these Phillies to a championship. And the city of Philly is, is completely in love with the guy and future Hall of Famer. There, there's not enough great things to say about him. He's had electrifying moments in that uniform already. 
Yeah. I mean, I think it was, co- he's looked at as cocky earlier just because of his age. And now it's just kind of people expect it from him, both the performance yep. and his reactions. And he delivers. Um, and he delivers, you know, he, he backs it up. And like you said, I mean, he went on, uh, like talked about the city of Philadelphia for like a few minutes the other day in a presser. He just, he loves it. He loves the crowd. He loves, you know, everything that it represents. And so, you know, it's always cool to to see guys and and cities that kind of gel well like that, especially with like the biggest names in baseball. So um, it's also crazy to think with like how he got to start with Washington that by the end of his career he'll probably be thought of as a as a Philly. No doubt about it. Yeah, he's 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 on a roll. Um, my number three guy for for W's is uh, for winners this week and in, in our ups is Tori Lavello. And we just got off talking about the managerial carousel that's going to happen this winter. And we've mentioned at times how it's very difficult in baseball to keep your job, keep your job. You basically get hired to be fired. That happens with every job, every sport. And Terry, Fr- uh, not Terry Francona, uh, Tori Lavello, who was formerly of the Boston Red Sox, came up through the John Farrell pipeline, right? Uh, he's He's been a few other places. Um He's been there since 2017. First year, he won 90, 93 games, right? Made the postseason. I think he was manager of the year that year also. Manager of the year. Yep, won 93 games. And then the next year, kind of went down to earth a little bit, won 82 games, won 85 games. And then the COVID year was below 500. And then 2021, lost 110 games, right? Usually after you know a few mediocre seasons, you would get you know your head cut and you'd be let go. Uh, yeah. And then next year, even further proof, another down year. But the ability for the, you know, the Arizona front office to believe in Tori Lovello and give him a chance to take this team through the postseason is so admirable. And and I think teams need to do this more with managers. And I know the expectation to win is high. Uh, and it was a perfect situation. Arizona is not a big market in baseball. Uh, it's a team that probably had the ability to and the wherewithal to to have patience with them in the first place. And I think it would be great for more teams to stick with their manager if they feel that he's doing a good job through the ups and downs, right? There's too many, there's way too many scapegoats in this game. Um, and and maybe for reason, for good reason. But at the same time, I think it's important to understand that the managerial position maybe deserves definitely some accountability, deserves some blame, but isn't always as to blame as we think yeah i mean i think it shows that you know if you have a guy that you believe in and you know it just takes some time to get the roster that you want him to have if you can stick through it you could be where the diamondbacks are right now and so you know like you said kind of quite the the roller coaster uh results wise for him but they they stuck with him and they knew they needed to get him a, a roster that he could work with and now they're going to be competing for a spot in the World Series this week. Yeah, no doubt. I'm just very happy for him. Very happy for the Diamondbacks. And yeah, it was it was really fun watching him and the the GM celebrating uh, beating uh, the Dodgers. Uh, they were going all out, just like the players. So that was really fun to watch. I mean, obviously he's been through some some lows there, and now he's back on top and enjoying it. So yeah, definitely happy for him. Yep, Tori Lavello and Mike Hazen, the good 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 uh, examples of when a team has confidence in guys and they, they takes a little bit, but they end up getting the job done. So very happy for them. Um, and very happy for us, Tyler, for completing this episode in preparation for the championship series. And uh, I, I think we, uh, we ended up shutting it down again. We shut it down for the 33rd time. Look at us go. Man. Oh man. Oh man. Oh Manny. That's what they used to <laughs> forgot who used to say that about Manny Ramirez, man. Oh man. Oh Manny. Uh, but yeah, no, this was great and uh, appreciate everybody for listening. We'll be back um, uh, for some more postseason stuff, I'm sure, recapping all the action. And you guys could follow us on Twitter at R- Shutdown Inning. No, I did that as a joke. Shutdown underscore inning on Twitter. Uh, go check us out on Spotify, wherever you find your podcasts. And yeah, see you next time. And have that's a what's up. Oh, that's what's up. I screwed it up. <laughs>